What do salmon, the Athabasca Glacier, and shorts have to do with each other? And how are they related to thermochemistry? Stick around to find out. You probably have an intuitive idea about the relationship between temperature and the position of equilibrium in a reaction. For example, you're almost certainly familiar with the melting of ice. Chemically, we call this reaction a phase change of water from solid to liquid. Maybe this is a better example. Start with a lot of ice, add a lot of heat. We can all make a pretty good guess as to what phase that missing ice is in now. Pretty clearly, raising the temperature favors the formation of product, and lowering the temperature favors the formation of reactant. Here's another commonplace example. Table salt dissolves better in hot water than in cold water. If we add table salt to water, eventually we get to the point where the salt won't dissolve anymore. Grains of salt just drift around in the water. If we add heat, those grains of salt finally dissolve. Again, raising the temperature favors the formation of product, and lowering the temperature favors the formation of reactant. Of course, raising the temperature doesn't always favor product. Dissolving oxygen in water, for example, is disfavored by an increase in temperature, which is why salmon prefer cold streams. There is actually a quantitative analytic relationship between the temperature change and the position of equilibrium that involves the energy change for the reaction. This experiment explores that relationship, all without laboratory chemicals or labware. We will consider the reaction whereby humans change from wearing long pants to wearing shorts. We call this the disrobing reaction. Let's start with the theory. There's some mathematics here, mostly AP level algebra. As always, try to follow along. If you miss anything, you should still be able to follow the experiment and you can always come back and review later if you wish. Consider a generic reaction with reactants R and products P. Mathematically, the free energy change for the process, delta G, may be written like this, where delta G naught is the standard free energy change, R is a gas law constant, T is absolute temperature, and Q is the reaction quotient, which is the ratio of the product and reactant concentrations. The thermodynamic definition of equilibrium is that delta G equals zero, at which point Q equals K. This yields a temperature-dependent relationship between the equilibrium constant and the standard free energy change. Isolating K gives this. Next, we will employ the relationship among free energy change, enthalpy change, and entropy change. By substitution, we get this. Now let's separate the factors and take the log of both sides writing 1 over t as the independent variable. If we substitute the reaction quotient for k, we obtain this form. If you have a little mathematical insight, you will see that in this form, y equals m times x plus b. In other words, if we plot the log of the ratio of the product and reactant concentrations as a function of 1 over temperature, we will get a straight line, the slope of which is equal to minus the change in enthalpy over R, and the intercept of which is equal to the entropy change over R. These relationships are useful, in part because accurate concentration measurements are often much easier than accurate thermochemical measurements. By measurement of concentrations, we can determine thermochemical quantities. For this experiment, you will need a computer with access to the internet spreadsheet software, and a browser. To take data, you will observe a sample of humans and record the number wearing long pants, the number wearing shorts, and the temperature. Here the experiment gets a little tricky. Not all humans will easily categorize in this way and you will need to plan a systematic way of dealing with this. For example, you will have to decide how long a skirt must be to qualify as shorts, or whether leggings should be classified as long or short. That's part of doing experimental science, figuring out how to categorize the data. 
since you probably can't just look out the window and observe a sufficiently large sample of humans, and you certainly can't control the temperature, your instrument will be a computer with web access. You can then access webcams from around the world and look for humans in different temperature environments. You'll have to look for webcams that display humans with reasonable frequency and in sufficient detail to categorize their attire. A skyline view of a city or a panorama of mountains does no good here. Close-up street scenes work well. Moreover, you will need to be able to determine the temperature, perhaps by looking up the current weather report for that location. By looking at webcams from around the world, you can sample at different temperatures. Here is an example of data taking. Find a view. Record the temperature. Be sure to record the units, too. Find people. Count the ones wearing shorts. Count the ones wearing long pants. Collect a lot of data. More is better. Try to avoid taking samples that might bias the data. For example, a beach scene is likely to show an anomalously high fraction of people in shorts because people usually expect shorts weather when going to the beach. If you didn't take data directly into a spreadsheet, you'll want to enter it into one now. Start by entering each temperature from which you have data into a column. I've done that in column A here. This data is in degrees Fahrenheit. Next, I created a column to convert the temperature into degrees C. I've done that in column B. If I click cell B2, you can see the conversion formula. Next, I used column C to convert the data to degrees K. Clicking on cell C2 shows the conversion. Column D computes 1 over temperature. Clicking on cell D2 shows the conversion. Next, enter the data. In column E, I've entered the number of people wearing shorts at each temperature. In column F, I've entered the number of people dressed in long pants at each temperature. Column G computes the equilibrium constant. Selecting cell G2 shows the formula. There is an important technical detail here. It's probably best to discard any temperatures and associated data for which everyone is wearing long pants or everyone is wearing shorts. These cases will cause the equilibrium constant to be either undefined or zero, respectively, neither of which is physical. Of course, if you took data long enough, you'd probably find someone dressed in shorts on New Year's Day in Anchorage or wearing long pants in Tucson in August but you don't want to invest that much time. You can just avoid these situations and get reasonable results. After you have entered the data, create a column and compute the log of K. That's done in column H here. Selecting H2 shows the conversion. Next, plot the log of the equilibrium constant versus the reciprocal of temperature. Fit the data to a straight line and extract the slope and intercept. You can do this directly on the graph, but using the statistics functions usually gets more accurate results. Here, cell I3 shows the slope and cell J3 shows the intercept. What is the enthalpy change for a single human to change into shorts? I encourage you to pause the video now and do the calculation for yourself before viewing the result. It's a much more lasting educational exercise to work through it yourself. When you are done, come back and compare your answer. Now that you are back, here are the results. Multiplying the slope by minus the gas law constant yields the enthalpy change. That's done in cell J8 here. I suggest that you use SI units. This result is in joules per mole. That's silly. Nobody deals with humans in molar quantities. Dividing by Avogadro's number produces the result in joules per person. That's done in J10 
here. Your next step is to try to make sense of these results. Are they physically reasonable? Try this comparison. Compute the energy required to climb a flight of stairs. You will need your mass, the acceleration due to gravity, and the height of a flight of stairs. Then, using the equivalence of work and energy, compute work, which is force times distance, which is mass times acceleration times distance. Convert everything into the same units that you used for the disrobing reaction experiment. Does it take more energy to climb a flight of stairs or to change into shorts? I encourage you to pause the video now and do the calculation for yourself before reviewing results. After you've done that, think about whether your result makes sense. Okay, so you're back now. Here's the result. Clearly the energy required to climb a flight of stairs is a whole lot larger than the enthalpy change for the disrobing reaction. Now try another comparison. Compute the energy required to lift a one kilogram textbook off the floor and place it on a tabletop one meter above the floor. Does it take more energy to lift a textbook or to change into shorts. I'll introduce another break here so you can pause and do the calculation for yourself before reviewing the result. Okay, so you're back now. Here's the result. Clearly, even lifting a book takes a whole lot more energy than the enthalpy change from the disrobing reaction. What's going on here? Now try a third comparison. What's the energy change for a typical chemical reaction? For example, the combustion of methane, and that's cooking gas. We can just search the web for heat of combustion of methane to get the energy change per mole of methane. From there, it's easy to find the energy change per molecule of methane. Here's another pause so you can do the calculation yourself and think about the result. Back already? Here's the result. So the enthalpy change for the disrobing reaction is much closer in magnitude to the heat released upon combustion of a single molecule of methane than it is for physical activities like climbing a flight of stairs or lifting a book. Why is that? What's the actual reaction we are probing? Clearly, it isn't the physical act of changing clothes. You might then suspect that it is the chemical process in our brain associated with the decision to change clothes. But the temperature within the human body is very tightly controlled at 37 degrees C, regardless of the outside temperature. So the fact that the position of the equilibrium changes with the outside temperature suggests that's not the explanation either. It seems more likely to be the energy change for a chemical process in our skin that triggers the nerves to send a signal to our brain telling us that we are hot or cold. So now you have an order of magnitude estimate of how much energy it takes to trigger a nerve. I'll bet you never did that in a traditional chemistry laboratory experiment.